So, no, I, I wouldn't say I have a passion for HR. Welcome back to Human Resources for the People. It's a human capital revolution. Today, we're going to be talking about a ruling out of Australia and what we can learn about American labor law. And uh, so this is from Callis Kinney and Telex. They are a employment law firm. Check them out. This is written by Heather Richardson and Jessica Seferis. Link down below if you'd like to read more or look at their other stuff. It's quite interesting, especially from an Australian point of view. So check it out. So I'm kind of surprised about what's coming out of Australia, especially coming from 2020, 2021, and 2022. Uh, just in June of this year, uh, the Fair Work Commission, you know, did not say or said that working from home is not unilateral, that bosses have the right to get workers back to the office post-pandemic. Um, and, you know, the labor expanded its flexible work law. So I find that to be interesting. So they made that uh, decision. And that this is from November, right? When they did that, they emphasized the point of or the importance for face to face contact in their opinion. And so, again, I quite frequently I hear, well, if the United States had labor laws like this country or that country, we would not be forced to go back into the office, for example, something like that. And so we're going to take a look at something like this. Um, there's Gregory versus Maxia. Uh, the employee wanted to work from home for two reasons. Uh, they had a school-aged child who he cared for every second week, and he suffered from inflammatory bowel disease, I, I assume IBS, and as a result, he has to go to the bathroom quite frequently. So let's just stop it right there before we move on because these are two separate things in the United States depending on the nature of the care for the the school aged child he could be eligible for FMLA which would be unpaid protected leave from work um, and then on the second piece he would be uh, potentially gone through the uh, ADA or the or reasonable accommodation process in theory at least um, so that's important to understand in this specific case they kind of combine it because it's with the fair work council and i think i keep saying fair work council but it's a fair work commission so in australia they're tied this fair work commission is tied to the evolution of the country's industrial relations framework uh, before the creation of the commission australia had several other bodies uh, including most importantly the australia industrial relations commission there was the establishment of Fair Work Australia. In 2009, the Australian government under Prime Minister Kevin Rudd replaced the Australian Industrial Relations Commission with a new industrial relations system called Fair Work Australia. It was part of the broader Fair Work Act of 2009. And this was Fair Work Australia had a broader scope, was tasked with overseeing industrial relations, setting minimum employment conditions and resolving workplace disputes. It then, three years later, was renamed to the Fair Work Commission, but didn't really ultimately change. And then it operates as an independent tribunal represent, uh, re responsible for a conciliation and arbitration in industrial disputes, reviewing and setting minimum wages, and making decisions on workplace matters. And that's why we're here today. In the United States, these would be solved by two, or these would be considered under two separate act, separate acts, right? You have the Americans with Disabilities Act for uh, number two. You have FMLA potentially for number one. That's a, that's a question. It depends on whether or not the school age child has a serious health condition. Um, but ultimately, the employer, uh, in this case, Maxia, did not agree to the employee's request and said, hey, you can work 20% in the office and 40% uh, for approximately one month and 40% thereafter, and then you could choose. And the employee rejected it. Now, if the care for the child fell under FMLA, in this scenario, the company would be in a lot of trouble, right? Because if it fell under FMLA, uh, then you know, it, it'd be a violation of the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. Um, but beyond that, then the employer made the decision, uh, employer rejected the application for a flexible working arrangement under the following things. And this seems very ambiguous. The employee had two separate situations that were not really related uh, one in the United States would be an ADA concern. One would be FMLA out, outside of it. The employer rejected it uh, because they 
he was the sole provider of salary packaging services for the Australian South Australian government. And the requirement was to answer calls quickly uh, within three minutes and emails within two days. And it wasn't looking likely. He was also not meeting daily productivity targets. Uh, it, it was beneficial to observe and support the employee in the office and wanted to remain fair and consistent across the business and that the employee uh, was struggling mentally and proper support could not be made, provided remotely. And so the Fair Work Commission ultimately found it was reasonable for the employer to refuse to allow the employee to work 100% from home. And, you know, here, again, there's a lot of multiple reasons and sort of, as far as I can tell, very murky with respect to uh, this discussion. In the United States, it's quite clear, uh, you know, if it's a disability, which IBS generally is a disability, um, then you know, the question is whether or not it's a reasonable accommodation. Now, generally speaking, work from home isn't a reasonable accommodation to resolve things like IBS, but in theory, it could be, and many courts would allow it. Um, it's, 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 it's a very possible, very great possibility that IBS would be covered under uh, a reasonable accommodation in many scenarios. And so this ultimately, again, went to the Fair Work Commission as a tribunal and kind of a collective concern. But each of these in the United States would have been uh, divided up appropriately, one under the ADA and one under, one under the FMLA. Uh, so let me know what you think. Is, is the American system wrong in this scenario? Uh, is it right? How can you compare? What has been your experience under the Australian system, if you have any? And let me know in the comments down below. Like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye, guys.